Hey, it's Bill Spadia. On tonight's special chasing news, Alex Zidan investigates three murder mysteries. Each case has left behind several painful and controversial questions. What really happened? And are the killers still out there? Now on Chasing News. I'm Alex Sedan. Tonight on a special Chasing News, three murder mysteries, three brutal slayings where the truth might not be as it seems. My partner in these investigations is Gary Britton, a retired homicide detective who brings the expertise of more than 200 murder investigations. But we need your help. Maybe you can help us catch a killer and bring some small measure of comfort to the families of these lost souls. Our first case takes us to Atlantic City and the serial killer known as the Eastbound Strangler. A serial killer stalked the streets of Atlantic City, strangling prostitutes and leaving them in a narrow ditch behind a seedy motel. In November 2006, the bodies of these four women were discovered behind the Golden Key Motel in Egg Harbor Township, their shoes and socks missing, and their bodies with their faces pointed eastward towards the gold and silver spires of Atlantic City across the bay. The media called the killer the Eastbound Strangler. And no one's ever been arrested and charged with this crime. The Golden Key was demolished last summer, but Gary and I went to check out the lay of the land. The site still has an eeriness that's hard to put your finger on, but it's very, very palpable. The background of this is very important because of another case that Gary was involved in just two years later, that of a man named Dennis Gaskell. Now, Gary was on an anti-gun federal task force when this man, Dennis Gaskell, Little Egg Harbor resident, was arrested in Kokomo, Indiana, for stealing a gun at a gun show. When authorities executed a search warrant at his home in Little Egg, they found a virtual arsenal of over 70 guns he allegedly had stolen from across the country during his time as a long haul trucker and stockpiled in his house. Gary got to review some of the evidence and that took him into the sinister world of Dennis Gaskell. I found this individual to be one of the most bizarre human beings that I've ever encountered. He had drawings that he obviously did with his hand that would depict himself with both male and female genitalia, holding weapons. Dennis Gaskell obviously had issues of anger towards women. He would cut out animals from Field and Stream magazine and combine them in virtual centaurs with faces of centerfolds from penthouse. He would take them to the gun range and demolish the faces of the women with bullets, leaving the deer untouched. And we'd love to talk to Dennis Gaskell, but we can't. Just days after he was told he was gonna be extradited to New Jersey, Gaskell strangled himself with a piece of clothing inside his Indiana jail cell. I obtained a criminal profile of the Eastbound Strangler, written by noted criminal profiler John Kelly. And when Gary and I went through it, the parallels between this profile and Dennis Gaskell were nothing short of astonishing. This lethal predator is a local male who was very familiar with the Atlantic City area. His hobbies would include art and photography. The graphic pictures that he would draw were you know, I, I can't even describe them. They were so bizarre. And this profile even predicts what would happen if this killer is captured. When dealing with a dangerous man like this, he would commit a final act of control, which would be suicide. Wow, this guy's obviously got some issues. Well, they, they all do. Yeah. In 2006, a criminal profile was done of the Eastbound Strangler serial killer by noted profiler John Kelly. Well, after we aired our story, incredibly, Kelly, one of the most noted profilers in the country, who's done work on the Green River serial killer case, who was the most prolific serial killer in American history, called us. Do you think we're on to something? I think you're definitely on to something with Dennis Gaskell. We sat down to talk with Kelly to talk about who this person could be. Gaskell or no, we needed to know more about the methodology and the mind of the Eastbound Strangler. These guys can portray a mask of sanity for the family, the neighbors, people that know him get to see that. Boy, he's such a real nice guy, he's so charming. The serial killers that you've dealt with, and this serial killer in particular, wants to appear normal to his neighbors and to the outside world. Absolutely, that's how he stays camouflaged. If this guy is a serial killer, this guy has bodies elsewhere. We got a hell of a tip. A concerned citizen contacted Kelly and said he had found a bag with multicolored drawings, 
and women's shoes. You think we can hook up so I can talk to you a little bit about that? So we headed down to Galloway to check out this tip and we met our contact at a local Starbucks. He was willing to help us, but he did not want to go on camera. So we asked him first and foremost, how did you find this stuff? Are you guys familiar with like astral projection and getting what? signs and... I've heard of it, but I forget what it means. Astral projection is when you leave your body while dreaming. After a long story about following black keys because they were some sort of sign, our source told us that he had meandered his way to an isolated area of woods off a road in Egg Harbor Township. Inside half-buried tires, he had found bags stuffed in the walls of those tires, and he made the chilling discovery drawings, sex toys, a huge cache of porn and lewd photos, and one pair of women's shoes. He agreed to let us examine the evidence. It's very random. We were looking for any clue that could connect or rule out Gaskell. Like blood in there? Hey, it could be anything. Why would you have something like that? Why would you say that? To cover what you have. It's the only reason that is, covering what you have. Who would do that? Somebody who's conflicted in who they are. And the shoes, pink, size 11, with heels that lit up. This is someone who is probably pretty tall and or large. And or a man wearing women's shoes. We walked behind the cemetery that backs up to where this stuff was found. And we saw some railroad tracks with a path next to them. It started to look familiar. Gary and I got into the car and when the road ended, we took a couple of turns drove less than four miles, and where were we? We were at the Golden Key Motel, the site of where the women were found in 2006, where the eastbound strangler had dumped his victims. He actually expressed, as far as I'm concerned, his art by the way he positioned them. If you think about it, these girls, in his mind, were nothing but garbage. And if we were gonna find out who the eastbound strangler was, we needed to talk to the best of the best at analyzing serial killers' minds. And that's John Kelly. Violent sexual predators are extremely hypersexual. And this, to me, looks like a very, very hypersexual person who may be in a sexual identity crisis. Right here, you've got something around this individual's neck You've got eyes bulging out of their sockets, and you have red on the face. I wondered if this was a paper death mask, a handmade image created by the killer depicting the moment this woman lost her life. Now see, this is very, very interesting. You've got this person who is just a female face in the crown who has become a sexual entity for whatever reason. Who is this person? Do you recognize her? She doesn't look like the Stranglers' four victims, but we don't know who she is and we'd like to find out. And then I finally asked John about the hand-drawn detailed map that we talked about earlier. I see the church. Again, I see a ship coming in. This person obviously has drawn a time machine because they want to go back to a time I have to feel that was better for them and they were happier. Obviously, this person is not happy with their reality. Retired homicide detective Gary Britton and I decided to check out one of the few things on these laminated pieces of paper that seemed to make any logical sense. The name Crazy Horse and the phrase Too Many Rules, accompanied by some sort of stick figure symbol on the back of the card. The word Delilah was also clearly visible, so we went to the Crazy Horse Cabaret, which is on East Delilah Road in Pleasantville, just one town over from Atlantic City. I compared the club's sign with the scan of the drawing that I had on my phone. We spoke with Greg Daly, the DJ at the club, who's one of the few employees there that was working at the time of the Strangler murders in 2006, and we immediately showed him Gaskell's picture. Does this man look familiar at all to you? No, he doesn't. You've never seen this guy? 
No. To our surprise, he said drawing pictures was not that uncommon. I've worked here for years, and there'll be occasionally people that will show up and draw stuff. But the people that tend to show up and draw stuff, like, work really hard at it. They're not drawing like a nine-year-old, you know right. what I mean? And then he told us a real shocker about something that had happened two years after the Strangler murders. Around 2008 or so, we had a guy in his mid-20s was all drunk here at the bar. Started ranting about how he killed all those hookers and all kinds of craziness. But uh, we called the cops. They came around and uh, interviewed him a little bit. Nothing else came from that. Gasco was 52 when he died in 2010. There was no mistaking him for a 20-something in 2008. So it could not have been him. Who were we talking about? As we left the club, we stopped at the office to thank the manager. While we were in there, we talked to the doorman, Herb Utter. Do you recall a name of this guy? Nah, name no, face yes. Anything odd about him, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. He was odd all together. Really? <laughs> really? Herb remembered Gaskell right away from Herb's time working at a bar called Pistol Pete's in the same town in Pleasantville. It was just, it was not, you could tell the elevator didn't go to the top floor. He just wasn't <laughs> there. Uh, I'm serious. It was just like he'd come in, he'd stay around, he'd order a drink. He might take two sips out of it, and then he'd just sit there the rest of the night just like staring at people, just weird. And it would freak people out. As Gary, who had seen the drawings that Gaskell had made before, had said, that description fits Gaskell to a T. A strange person and the antisocial behavior that's evident in the eastbound Strangler profile is also contained in Herb's description. At the very least, we've put Gaskell in the area around the time of the murders and are inching closer to more proof that he could be the eastbound Strangler. But now we have three leads to run down. Dennis Gaskell, whoever left those pictures in the woods, and some 20-something person who made a drunken confession in this bar to the eastbound Strangler murders. The Atlanta County Prosecutor's Office has refused to say whether Dennis Gaskill was or is a person of interest in the eastbound Strangler case. Coming up, we go to Long Island for another set of serial murders. Could they be connected? Retired homicide detective Gary Britton and I headed into Manhattan to meet with Dr. Michael Bodden, a distinguished forensic pathologist who's done more than 20,000 autopsies, to talk about a string of murders in the area of Gilgo Beach on Long Island. Authorities had said they were the work of a serial killer, and most were women, some prostitutes, like our girls who were found behind the motel in Atlantic City. Could this be connected? Every time you don't catch the guy or you catch the wrong guy, the real guy is still out there, and these tend to be Serial murders tend to do things over and over again, and sometimes they do it differently. Discoveries by police in 2010, 2011, and 2012 had made Ocean Parkway on Long Island seem like a highway of death. In all, 10 bodies and body parts were discovered out there amid the thick brush and reedy marshes that make up the terrain. Mostly, they were women, but one man and one toddler were discovered left amid these desolate dunes. Though there was some dispute, authorities ultimately admitted they were dealing with a serial killer and the FBI was called in earlier this year. This serial killer became known as the Craigslist Ripper because at least four of these women had been solicited on Craigslist while they were selling prostitution services. Bodden was working with the family of Shannon Gilbert, who was 23 when she disappeared on May 1st, 2010. It was her disappearance that blew the lid off this entire thing because in the 18 months they were searching for Gilbert, the other victims were turned up. There were similarities with the other victims, but police have actually said she wasn't murdered. I've done this for many decades, come across many serial murderers, many places where bodies were dumped. I've never seen two serial murderers dump bodies in the same, same place. Spot. So is it possible that Shannon Gilbert was killed by the Gilgo Beach serial killer? I think that it has to be investigated. It's the pre-dawn hours of May 1st, 2010. A terrified young woman runs down the stairs of a Long Island beach home where she had been hired as an escort, frantically dialing 911, screaming for help. That's where it starts, right in there? Right in there. And in that call, she definitely says, they're trying to kill me. But Shannon Gilbert couldn't tell the dispatcher where she was. And so the police don't come. In the darkness, her life ends. 
Nearly six years later, we were back at the same location, tracing the last steps of Shannon Gilbert to this gated community nearby Gilgo Beach. This is where Shannon disappeared in 2010. There we met attorney John Ray, who was investigating the death on behalf of the Gilbert family, even though police labeled it an accident long ago. Back in 2010, a driver that Shannon was using had dropped her off at the home of a John in the Oak Beach Island Association, who had hired her via Craigslist for sex. On the second floor here is the party room. That's where she was. Around 3 a.m., something went wrong. Shannon went flying down the stairs, down the driveway, and onto the streets of the neighborhood, trying to escape something. As the sun was rising, people, including neighbor Barbara Brennan, saw their last glimpse of Shannon before police say she disappeared into the reedy marsh. The reeds there are thorny, they're thick, there's a lot of underbrush, it's really tough going for a guy who was wearing boots in the daylight. I don't know how a young woman in ballerina shoes would have navigated it. Anything's possible when you're in terror, but it ain't easy. John Ray, he thinks that Shannon did not go into the marsh alive, that she might have not gone there at all. In fact, he thinks she was killed elsewhere and dumped there. The best place to put the body is 50 yards in, right about here, at the widest part of the marsh. Still nearly six years and two autopsies later, no one has been arrested. Before we left, we walked Gilgo Beach on both the ocean side where people can abandon their cares for a day of summer fun and the marsh side that's full of brambles, pines and rough terrain where bodies slept in death for years before they were found during the search for Shannon Gilbert. From Jones Beach where the skull of an unidentified woman was found to the spot where a dead body and her toddler child were also found far from her mother's side to the heads, hands and forearm of 20 year old Jessica Taylor to the four women hired from Craigslist whose bodies were found in bags just a third of a mile apart. Two brutal sets of serial murders. Two killers on the loose, or more. We need your help. If you recognize any of these victims, if you have any idea what could have happened to them, tweet me at Chasing Zidane or tweet the show at Chasing News. Coming up, it's been called the crime of the century. Was Charles Lindbergh responsible for the kidnapping of his own baby? final story takes us back in time. There have been few cases in American history bigger than the kidnapping and murder of Charles Lindbergh's baby. 80 years ago, Bruno Richard Houtman was executed for the crime. But authorities then and now believed he did not act alone. They were never able to prove it, but could modern investigative techniques point to an inside job involving a member of the Lindbergh's household? Charles Lindbergh was the most famous American alive in 1932 when his little son was kidnapped from their home in Hopewell Township, disappeared without a trace, ransom notes were left. Later on, the child was found dead along the side of the road. The case and trial gripped the nation for years. Finally, Bruno Hauptmann was arrested, tried and convicted for the murder. But all these years later, there's questions about whether he actually did it or if he had some help. So I want to talk to Lloyd Gardner, who has an incredible theory. Is it possible that Charles Lindbergh was responsible for his own child's kidnapping and death? Yes, it's possible that he was certainly involved in setting it up. Exhibit number one, motivation. The child was born with several medical conditions. Now, this is important because Charles Lindbergh was into eugenics at the time, which is trying to allegedly clean out the gene pool by selective breeding of so-called best people. Charles Lindbergh was six foot four, he was blonde, he was athletic, he considered himself a super person, and the great lone eagle could not have had a child with rickets. He had feet that were bent inward, uh, teeth that were coming in wrong. At his last medical examination, the doctor could not get him to stand up straight. We went up to the Lindbergh Estate in Hopewell, still there. It's run by the Juvenile Justice Commission. It's a home for girls. If it was a, a prominent person such as this, you'd have federal authorities here. You know, a kidnapping, that's a federal crime now. It wasn't in 1932. One of the biggest questions, 
how did the kidnappers know the right window to pick in this very large house? What about the pins that were used to hold the baby into his blankets? The blankets that were found neatly folded away as if someone knew how the baby slept. They only found $19,000 of the ransom money in Hauptmann's house and there was 50,000 sent out in total suggesting multiple portions. And if you want to go on a treasure hunt for that money, I have a start for you. It's in the New Jersey State Police archives and it's a piece of a tabletop from the Lindbergh case. It's been there for almost 70 years. The story of the table starts in 1948 when someone found it and brought it into the state police and it includes what you might say is a confession to the Lindbergh murder written in pencil on it in German. It starts, in Hamburg I wore velvet and silk. I cannot tell you my name because I was one of the kidnappers of the Lindbergh baby and not Bruno Richard Hauptmann. The rest of the ransom money lies buried in Summit, New Jersey. There's a signature, NSDAP, the German initials of the Nazi party. What makes this tabletop even more interesting is that when Mark Falzini, the state police archivist, took the ransom letters that had a specific signature at the bottom and lined the three holes up with the three holes at the top of this tabletop, they matched perfectly. Do you think this is an important piece of evidence in the case? It certainly seems to be. All these cases are still mysteries. And there's so many unsolved crimes out there, there's definitely more investigating to be done. If you have a case that you'd like us to look into, tweet me at Chasing Zidane, tweet the show at Chasing News, or go on to our Facebook page. The Chasing News is going to be back tomorrow, but the chase to catch killers never ends. In the meantime, try to stay on the well-lit path, because I'll take the dark one.